How many are ready for football to start back? Amen. Well, I want you to look around. These are God's children right here. They understand it. Two words you need to know? Roll tight. Okay, you don't have to say it. Just me and Milo. All right, go, go Tigers? Really? Not LSU. Really. You're, you're, you need to go to the back. No. The game was down to the wire. It was one of those epic games where it was a slugfest. You know what I'm talking about? Where like you're looking, you're rooting for it, and you're kind of got that sinking feeling that whoever has the ball last is probably going to be the one who wins. You know what I'm talking about? The home stadium was packed, and the home team was doing good until the last quarter, and then the wheels just kind of came off, and they found themselves down by six. They needed to score a touchdown and kick the extra point just to have a shot at victory. Just one problem. They had no more timeouts. And it was down to about 30 seconds left. Quarterback's at the 40-yard line, their 40-yard line. He hikes the ball, sees the field, makes this play, gives some kind of unaudible signal to the wide receiver to go cut back and try to shake that safety free. Comes back, it works. The safety bites on the fake, and the wide receiver goes flying down the field. The quarterback fakes the handoff throws the ball, and the whole stadium holds their collective breath as the ball arcs through the air, and the receiver just fingertip catches it, pulls it in, and begins streaking for the end zone. People are standing on their feet. They're going wild. Passes the 40, then the 30, then the 20, then the 10. Could this be it? Could it be? Could, are we finally going to win this? Has the curse been broken? Down to the five. The four people are throwing their babies up on the field. It is incredible. It's mass hysteria. They're going berserk. Popcorn everywhere. To the two. To the one. And then it happens. Because you knew it would, right? Your favorite team has to choke. He drops the football on the one-yard line. On the one-yard line. Now, it wasn't just a drop. He did it on purpose. He celebrated too soon. In fact, here's the actual footage as you see this. Here's the guy in the end zone. There's just one problem. Here's the ball on the one foot line. Crowd goes apoplectic. How does this keep happening? Y'all, I wish I could tell you this was a one-time event, but this happens over and over and over when you see sports. Look at the, look at the guy on the bottom right. What is he doing? Is that a headstand? There's the ball. Y'all, they don't finish strong. It's one of the first things coaches teach you. Tuck the ball, three points of contact, finish strong, get into the end zone, celebrate after you score. Do not prematurely celebrate a touchdown you didn't earn. And today we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 6. Go ahead and find it. If you haven't had your quiet time in Nehemiah lately, it'll give you a minute to find it. And just kind of hold your place there because I want to set the context. Context is so key here. Nehemiah is telling us, guys, it's irrelevant In the grand scheme of things, how you start your race. You know what matters? It's how you finish. It's how you finish. And here, Nehemiah is carrying the burden and the shame of Jerusalem's broken down walls that were once glorious and great citadels of defense. And now the gates are burned and missing. And he is granted rare permission to return from Babylonian exile to be the rebuilder of Jerusalem. And he, he assembles this incredible team of really good, competent people. And he's got this great master plan. And he manages this whole thing. And he has this vision that he casts to the people, just go with it. And after several long weeks of hard work, the completion was in sight. But, and this is a huge but, before we get to the good part in verse 15 where the wall was finished, Nehemiah actually came to a crossroads. He actually came to a part where he wrestled a little bit with, can I finish this? I'm sure getting a lot of opposition. People were coming against him. They were trying to discourage him, trying to get him tempted to quit. And he came this close to quitting too soon, just like we saw that football player who crossed the, the, bless you, who crossed the finish line way too soon. And he almost gave up. He almost believed the lies of the enemy. They started coming to him. So I want to hear everyone be on the same page. If you have ever found yourself discouraged by the enemy, or maybe you're discouraged right now, or maybe you're listening at home online, or you're out of town, and you're, you're tuning in, or this came up in your feed. It's not an accident. If you are discouraged, or you feel yourself distracted, or you feel yourself wrestling with an overwhelming amount of anxiety and doubt and fear right now, Nehemiah has a word for you today. It is so profound. Y'all, this is a word that actually I started working on three years ago, and today it's ready. 
It is so powerful what he says, the importance of finishing strong on the God-given assignment that each one of you have. So before we even start, what do you think? Has something popped in your mind? Is there something you've been wrestling with? Is there an assignment that God has given you that you're like, oh, I don't know if I should finish this? Or maybe a calling he's given you that you're wrestling with? Or maybe it's a task that you're not looking forward to, but you know God is saying, you need to finish this. So at the end of the race, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. See, there were some bad people that came up to Nehemiah to try to get him off his destiny. Look at it, chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Follow along. Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall, and now no gaps remained, though we had yet to set up the doors and the gates. Okay, so the gates were the last thing that needed to be hung. Other than that, it's done. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages over in the plain of Ono. Something wasn't right, though, he says, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, (laughs) and I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Now, you would think that that would be enough, right? Just send that message. Oh, no, no. Look at verse 4. Four more times they sent the same message, and each time I gave them the same reply. The fifth time, Sandalot's servant came with an open letter in his hand. Y'all remember that. We're going to come back to that open letter. Oh, my goodness. An open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There is a rumor. Oh, you got to love those rumors. Here it is. here's, Here's old school gossip going on. There's a rumor among the surrounding nations. And Geshem tells me it's true. Oh, so somebody's confirmed, right? You and the Jews are planning to rebel. And that's why you're building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you, look, there is a king in Judah. Oh, you can be very sure. Listen, listen, listen to the blackmail dripping through. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with who? With me. I love verse 8, right? He says, I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. In fact, you're making the whole thing up. Y'all remember that movie where, uh, I forget, it's Adam Sandler, and he's like trying to to convince these people that he's he's, he's like educated, and he says the worst like answer, and the guy's like, no, that's all. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your The fact that we had to hear it, we are now dumber having listened to you talk, right? That's what I get here in this picture. He says, there is no truth in any part. It's amazing. Every single thing you said was wrong. You're making this up. Verse 9, he sees through it, and he sees why. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the good work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Don't you love him? I love Nehemiah. Verse 10. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, and the grandson of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home. And he said, hey, let us meet together inside the temple of God, and we'll bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. Now, there's something happening here. He goes to meet with these people. So it's almost like he thinks they're trusted friends, but something doesn't sit right with Nehemiah. Look in verse 11. He says, wait, should someone in my position run from danger? Like, what is happening here? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I'm not going to do it. And I realized then that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambal, there's those two people again, they had hired him. Do you see what's happened? These guys had come and bribed these false prophets to to basically get him to sin. He knew he was a layman. He couldn't go in the temple. He's not allowed to go into the holy place. Think about this. And they hired him. Imagine the frustration. They were hoping to intimidate me, verse 13, and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Listen to his prayer in verse 14. So remember, O oh God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sambalot have done. And remember Noadiah, the prophet, and all the prophets like her, who have tried to intimidate me. Did it work? Verse 15. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. And when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, oh, they were not happy. They were frightened and they were humiliated. 
they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Wow, what a powerful story. Nehemiah's enemies come on the scene here in chapter 6 with one final last-ditch effort. They're trying to discourage him, and he's trying to finish strong. Anybody, any runners in here? Anybody run? Oh, where's Elias? Elias, you run. I know. All right, so any runner, if you had to talk about them, can start strong. You know what the hard part is? They will tell you it's the last lap. It's the kick, right? When you got to go that, that final stretch. That is where races are lost and won because so many people burn up and they quit too soon. Sometimes just when you see the finish line in sight, they were so close. It's not as important how you start your race. It's not even as important in the middle. It is how you finish that's most important. Billy Graham is often credited with saying, doesn't matter how you start your job, doesn't matter how you start your career, doesn't matter how you start your family, doesn't matter how you start your ministry. You know what matters, what shows you the mark of spiritual maturity? How you finish. And here, Nehemiah's goal was finally in sight. The walls were built. It looked awesome. And all that remained was hanging the gates. He was on the last lap of that long race. He had been up so many hills, so many mountaintops. He's been in so many valleys. And here it was. And as he sprinted to the finish line, he is shouting to us, 2021 people, listen, finish strong. I know you're tired. I know the pandemic has been a gut punch for everyone. Finish strong. He is warning us, don't get distracted from your mission. Keep the main thing the main thing. Focus. Stay off the side streets. Can you hear him? He's saying, finishing your task will be the hallmark of your legacy. This will be the spiritual maturity marker that everyone, your family, can see. So Nehemiah's first lesson for us today is this. Stay off those side streets. Keep focused. Don't get distracted. Don't go down the side streets. See, Sanballat, his longtime nemesis, comes along with a bunch of deceitful friends, and they're making one final attempt to derail him. They tried to trick him into multiple meetings that was designed to get him off on a side street. Look what they say. Verse 2, he says, come, let's meet. Not meet there. Let's go meet over here in the plain of Ono. <laughs> let's go over here. Can you come down off the wall? We want you to stop doing that. Come over here. Fortunately, Nehemiah is so focused, he says, no, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down to you. So here's what happened, okay? Notice, look close. Having failed to stop the good work that he was doing, the construction, look what they did. Nehemiah's opponents now decided to stop the man that God had sent by threatening rumors that they would be spread around and hopefully back to King Artaxerxes, right? Notice the threefold attack that the unseen enemy does. He still uses this today. I love what David Jeremiah writes. He says this. He says, this is a frequent tactic of the enemy. Oppose the work. If that doesn't work, then just threaten the workers. And if that doesn't work, attack the leader. Y'all, you see this all over the world. You see this in your office. You see this in churches. You see this in government. The enemy knows if Nehemiah could be intimidated by rumors or gossip or threats or provoked into defending himself, then the work stops. He is distracted. David Jeremiah goes on to write this. Satan's concern is not whether anyone believes the rumors. This blows my mind but rather whether he can use them simply to divert his targets from their divinely appointed task. Some of you are right here. Some of you are right here. And you have a divinely appointed task. And something has come up in your life. It could be this pandemic. It could be a health crisis. It could be something that has come out of left field. And it has diverted you. And you are struggling with your focus. This is the key word here for how Nehemiah was successful. He focused. So often when our task is almost done, some sandblot comes along, seemingly harmless, to get us to lose focus. And in Nehemiah's case, it was yet another meeting with people who did not even have his best interest at heart. Don't miss that. They tell, hey, let's go meet at a place called Oh No. What a perfect name. <laughs> He's like, oh no, I'm not doing it. Not once, not twice, not... Five different times says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going down this side street. This is a distraction. And every one of us have gotten off on a side street at one time or another. All right? So let's bring this up to today. In our world here in 2021, what is your oh no? What is your distraction? Has anyone ever been outside the country to Italy? Anybody ever been to Italy? Venice? Anybody go to Venice? Yeah? A couple people? Yes? I have heard that it is absolutely breathtaking. I want to go. 
farthest I've been is Siler City. We're going to get to Venice one day. But there is, there is a city in America actually called the Venice of America. I'm going to put a picture up. Does anyone recognize? It's on the East Coast. Anyone know who this is? <laughs> close, close. This is Fort Lauderdale. This is Fort Lauderdale. It's on the East Coast. And it has thousands of homes that go up and down these canals. There's so many canals that the preferred method of transportation for a lot of these people is water taxis. But the locals who live there know that if you have to drive, you better stay on the main roads. You better not get off on some of these side streets. I read about a pastor who lived there, and he was trying to learn all 200 miles of all these waterways. And he said, without fail, he would be late to somewhere, and he would say, oh, look at this traffic. I know a shortcut, right? Some of you are smiling because you've been, I know a shortcut. I can beat this traffic. And inevitably, every time he would go down a side street, and it would end in a cul-de-sac, a circle, or worse, a dead end inside a canal. And he would get so mad. And he would, see, what looked like a good thing at first ended up not being good. It ended up good was the enemy of the best. He thought a shortcut would be good. He thought, okay, I'll just go down this side street. And it ended up derailing him. Every time we go to Myrtle Beach, and we haven't been in many years, but for like five years in a row, it was a running joke. We would go down that main drag. Is that King's Highway or 17, right? You're going down, got all the putt-putt. You got Fuddruckers, right? You know what I'm talking about? You're going down. And you know the beach is to your left because you're heading south, and there's this stretch of land with trees and like parks and different things and houses. And on the other side of that, it's only like 200 yards, is the beach. Oh, the beach. I love the beach in winter. It's great. And all these trees are in the way. And every time I got to get over there because I know our hotel is on that strip, not far from that weird Ripley's thing. You know what I'm talking about? And so I'm like, we'll just cut through right here. And every, I'm not, you know. Every time I take a left, I'm like, this will cut through. And I find the one roundabout, and I'm stuck in this silly roundabout. I don't understand. And I come back out, and I'm at Captain D's. And I still, to this day, so next year, I'm not going to do that again. I will deliberately go another mile, take a left, and there's that same roundabout. I'm stuck. It's like a time warp. They did this like eight years in a row. I kinda, it's not funny. It hurts. It hurts. This is embarrassing. My kids are laughing like, man, dad's lost it. I'm sitting driving like, how can I? Felt like Chevy Chase, like, look, guys, Big Ben, Parliament. There it is again, just going in a circle. And here I am looking at this one roundabout. I get so mad. You all know I have to hold my hand out. And Amy just strokes it to soothe the savage beast. Just soothe. I'm like, oh. And I come back out, and there's Fuddruckers. Never even make it to the beach. Y'all, why? Because I took a shortcut. I could have gone down and taken the main track. No, I know better. I'm going to go find these shortcuts. You know why Nehemiah was successful? Because he wasn't like me. He had focus. And he said, I am not going to take these side streets. I'm not getting distracted. He had a laser-like focus. Look at verse 3. He says, I know I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it to go down to you? Don't get distracted, church. You hear me? Don't get distracted from the main mission. Keep the main thing the main thing. A few years ago, my family was in line at (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Milo knows where this is going. My wife's in the front seat in the van, Marin's in the passenger seat, and little Mercy is in the back seat, okay? It's a, it's a tinted window, you know, my little white van with the tinted windows. So they pull up, and there's this cute 17, 18-year-old boy with a little pad, like, hello, can I help you, right? Well, Mercy just is going beside herself, wanting to say hi to this guy, okay? So you got Amy right here in the driver's seat, here's Marin, and Mercy's tucked away in the back, screaming, hi! Hi, 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 hi. Mom, tell him hi. She, Amy's trying to order. I'm texting her. I'm like, hey, are you in line? Can you give me some minis? I love minis. Minis are good. Hash browns are good. Lab at a large, right? And she's like, uh, and it's so crazy, so distracting. She's going berserk. And finally, Amy just says, oh, oh my goodness, mercy, would you please be quiet? <sighs> Sir, I'm so sorry. My daughter just really, really wants to say hi to you. Could you please just say hi to her? This cute 78 year old boy never sees mercy. He leans in, looks at Marin. <laughs> Hi. All right. Marin. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Hi. Yep. He was distracted. He was distracted. Think about this. Like, how did he not see her? He's 17. She said, you know, I'm like, probably missed a soul connection right there because he was distracted by Chick fil A. Marin, Mercy's in the back, freaking out. Y'all, distractions do that, they come up at the silliest times. Think about how many distractions we deal with on a day-to-day basis. He is saying, stay focused, stay strong. The next lesson he has for us, stay off the sidelines. Stay faithful. Keep faithful in your ministry. Keep faithful in your marriage. Keep faithful in your job. Stay off the sidelines. 
Not one athlete in history has ever woken up and said, Mom, Dad, I'm praying that I barely make the team this year, and I'm hoping I can ride the bench and be a third-string punter. That's my life goal. No one says that. They don't say, oh, you want to be a backup? No, no, I want to be the backup to the backup. Nobody says that. Same thing with theater, stage, actors, dancers. No one says, I can't wait to go to Broadway and stand in the wings <laughs> while the spotlight's right here. I can't wait to be an understudy to the understudy. Nobody says that because nobody wants to be on the sidelines. And here, Nehemiah is wanting to avoid the sidelines as well. God has given him a God-sized task. And just before he completes his assignment, his adversaries come, and now they make another last-ditch effort to derail him. Look at verse 10. He says, Hey, let's meet together in the house of God. We'll go within the temple. We'll bolt the doors. What, in the, what are they thinking? And they're going to come and kill you. I think they're coming tonight. You don't think Nehemiah knew this was a trap? He knew something was wrong. His spirit, something, something's not right here. This, he's not a dummy. He knew as a layman, he's not even allowed to go within the temple. Something was wrong. He hadn't gone down a side street earlier, and he wasn't about to be put on the sidelines right now. And once again, he responds with a great question. Should a man of my reputation flee danger? Where would I go? What message would that send? They're trying to intimidate him and distract him. And then they send, oh, my favorite, an open letter. And they send it all around. Y'all, back then, this was the ultimate slap in the face. You didn't do this. You would send a sealed, confidential correspondence that was meant to be read by the one person, the sole person it was intended for. In fact, it was so serious, they would actually use a wax seal and an seal, uh, official insignia that would be put into the wax so that they would know this was for their eyes only. To do anything else was the ultimate sign of disrespect. Plus, it insinuated that everything in this letter now is common knowledge. <laughs> the whole public knows about this. See, the goal of the open letter was to intimidate and to slander Nehemiah into stopping his work. If they could get him distracted or discouraged or worse, to defend himself, the three deadly Ds. If they could get him distracted or discouraged or worse, waste valuable time defending himself, then the enemy wins. And in Nehemiah's case, these guys were not good. They knew this was not an accident. They sent an open letter and they did it on purpose. How sinister is that? Now, throughout the centuries, the method of communicating has changed a bit. We don't do this. We don't send a lot of open letters, and we don't have scrolls and stuff. You know, back in the Middle Ages, they'd have a town crier. They'd stand there, hear ye, hear ye, right? In the 1500s, 1600s, and in the 1800s, they would have a schoolhouse. They'd have a bulletin board out front where you could come, and you could tack up a plaque or a, a parchment of some sort of whatever you wanted to advertise, Betty's cook-off with chili or whatever is going to happen on the 4th or whatever. And they could do that. And then if you're old enough, you may remember cork boards in your own elementary school. Anybody remember having cork boards you could go? I, you still do that? All right, technology. Woo. I remember when I was in middle school, one of my favorite things was the teachers would pick a photo of a different student every week. And they would go and they would tack this photo up on the cork board. And they had these index cards. And everyone else's job was to go by and write a little encouraging note and tack it up there for all to see. Why don't we do that anymore? Can you imagine how different the world would be if instead of criticizing or complaining, we encouraged and we put up these notes? You know, I remember fifth grade, Mrs. St. Pierre. I remember to this day. She had a card up. The teacher did it too. I don't remember what anyone else said to me that year, but I remember Mrs. St. Pierre said, I love the way your eyes sparkle when you walk into a room. And I remember that. You think that was powerful? You think that meant something? There are schools still doing this. See, school's starting back. I just saw this beautiful meme. Some have already been in a track out, and they're doing their things. And since fall's rapidly coming... There was one bulletin board that had Halloween up, and it said, what is it that scares you the most? And they could go through, and they could ask this question. Paul was the first one, and Paul answered. He said, what scares me the most is werewolves. <laughs> okay, right? Isn't that one of your fears? Right? No? No? Just sit? Okay. Well, that was Paul. And then they went to the next one, and they said, Nina, what about you? What scares you the most, Nina? And Nina was scared by sharks, right? Those dreaded land sharks that get into your school and they come to those Sharknadoes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So we have 
werewolves and sharks, and then they talked to Dylan. And Dylan was asked what he's afraid of. The unstoppable marching of time that is slowly guiding us all towards an inevitable death. <laughs> I love Dylan. Isn't he a ray of sunshine? I hope he's at your next kid's birthday party, because he will be the life of the party. So Dylan has this, this incredible response, and then they go up to Catherine. Say, Catherine, what scares you the most? Dylan. <laughs> it's awesome. What scares you the most? Dylan. That's, he's my guy. You know, we don't write letters on paper like this anymore. We don't do scrolls and, and parchment. Today, it would be the equivalent of a group text. You ever get put on a group text, like at work or something, or like family members you didn't even know you had, and then you get like 37 notifications, something like, and you're like, how can I leave this conversation? I don't even know Billy Bob. Who is this? And you're trying to get out of it. Like, I got a text just this morning all the way from Africa. First text I ever got from our Ghana mission team. Pastor Bill was saying, y'all keep praying. It is going so good. We've completed our first week of ministry. And y'all, if you're listening online, you're able to watch this. We are so proud of you. They are doing a good work. They are not being distracted. They will not come down from the wall. They are representing you well, and you need to know that. So pray for them as they complete this next leg of their journey. It is awesome. We get texts, or maybe you've been put in a Zoom meeting, and it gets out of control, and, and you see that. That's how we do modern day. Or a group email, and everybody, for whatever reason, hits reply all, and it goes back, and you keep seeing it. You can see how this works, and you can see how devastating its effects are. All the way back in Nehemiah's day, it was just as destructive as it is today, but Nehemiah sees right through the wickedness, and he asks a great question. Should I fly in danger? Should I run from this? No, I'm going to confront it. Think about this. In contrast to Nehemiah's perseverance to finish strong, look at how we are today. Look how many people, how many men run out on their families. They bail. How many men and women might just give up and shirk their responsibilities? Or they've got a great opportunity before them, but they're too scared to take it. And so they start running away from some of the tasks that God is holding out for them, appointing for them to do. Some of you are there. Some of you right now are tired. You're worn out, man. This pandemic has been a throat punch. And all you want to do is just get away. And frankly, I don't blame you. There are many days I feel the same way. The easiest thing, man, would be to run for the exit or to find some, some escapism, right? Some hobby or something we pour ourselves into and just disappear. Say, I am done. I am out of here. Y'all, I want to say, that is nothing new. Read the Psalms. Read the Psalms. You see it all over the place. Too many people, just like the psalmist in Psalm 55, say, oh, if I just had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be free, right? Well, there's just one problem. You don't have wings, and you're not a bird. You're a human with the Holy Spirit living inside you if you know the Lord, and you have a mission. You don't get to just walk away from that. God has gifted you to reach your sphere of influence. Only you can do it. We're not a bird. We're a human, and we have to finish the race. Those who will hear, well done, good and faithful servant at the end of our journey are the ones who finish strong. Now, I know it's tough. It's like playing golf. Who does that? But if you've ever played in a tournament, I just learned it's 72 holes most of you. That's ridiculous. I'll play seven maybe if it's putt-putt. And I look at this and I think, you know what? Notice who wins the tournament. It's not who started fast, straight out of the gate. It's those who play well on the last few holes. Same thing with basketball. Who, who usually wins the final four? It's not those who blaze it out of the front and run out of gas halfway through. It's those who play the last two minutes with the strongest impact. Think about the Olympics, these mile runners. Man, that is brutal. Who is running a mile? Unless you're being chased, that is useless. And these people are running hard. It is for good reason that no one hands out a medal to who starts the race the fastest. That would be, that that's just defeats the whole point. It goes to the winner. It's the one who finishes strongest in the last 50 yards. That who is, that's who's always the winner. Same thing goes for the courtroom, right? The one place we want justice and fairness. We depend on that. In a courtroom, who usually comes out victorious? You know this. If you've seen Tom Cruise, I mean, that's the real deal right there The a few good men. The opening monologue, oh, that's good. That's important. Cross-examination, eh, it's okay. You know what matters? It's the final argument. This is what leaves a lasting impression on the jury, isn't it? We see this in Scripture. People rush to judgment. Look at the bottom, Proverbs 18. The first one to plead his case seems right. Oh, until the other one comes along and corrects it. Think about this. Think about this in your life. 
what seems to be right at first often turns out to be wrong, and we bail too early. Many times an apology is needed to say, hey, I only listened to half the story, and I believed it, and I was wrong. And I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? you got to make it right. You can't bail halfway through on your friends. You can't bail on your family. You don't want to bail on what God has given you. We have to finish strong. So let's consider the ultimate person who finishes strong, the ultimate example. No one has ever finished stronger than the Lord Jesus. Think about how many times Satan came and tried to tempt him. We just know about the ones in Scripture. Think this is a one and done thing? You don't think he had ridicule and shame and mocking? His own family said, who is this guy? Close friends didn't quite get it, even those closest to him. Like, yeah, we kind of think he's good. I don't know. He might be the most, we're not really sure. When the finish line for his race was in sight, and he was right there, he said this in John 17, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. I have completed the race. Well done. Good and faithful, sir. Isn't that what you want to hear? Man, that's my motivating factor. The enemy tried its best to get him on a side street, to get him sidelined. Even on the cross, his last minutes, think about what was said. Hey, if you're really the Messiah, why don't you come down off the cross? Go save, save yourself. Hey, if you do that, we'll all believe. We'll all, hey, we'll go, to, we'll go to Golden Corral. We'll get a buffet. Come on down if you want to do that. You know, they mocked him and ridiculed him and spat on him and teased him with his last dying breath. But Jesus kept focused. He stayed faithful. How about you? Because you know i got to ask. It's not just a nice story back then. How are you doing with that? What are the hallmarks of your faith? Is it faithfulness? Is it a laser-like focus like Nehemiah, like Jesus had? See, at the end of his life, Jesus was able to proclaim something no one else has ever been able to say to Telestai. It is finished. And then just like the exclamation point, he rose from the dead three days later. Do you know the Lord? See, as we draw closer to the return of the Lord, I hope you know the days will grow darker. I hope you know that men's hearts will grow colder. Family will turn on family. Children will turn on parents. Relatives. We will see this. In fact, we are seeing things that used to be called good are now being called evil. And things that we clearly knew was wrong are now being told, no, 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 that's right. The world has been turned upside down. Do you see it? Do you see it with spiritual eyes? Do you see the, do you see the, the tension? With standing for Christ, not being a jerk about it, but standing boldly with love and going along with the culture. Because I promise the lines are being deliberately blurred by our unseen enemy. This is not an accident. This has all been foretold. A few years ago, there was this beautiful scene in, uh, I think it was Batman versus Superman, where the bad guy, Lex Luthor, shows up, and he's got this painting behind him. And it's this classic painting. You say, here's a full-size one if you want to see it here on the right. But it's got the, the good angels up top. They're the ones in white and the big wings. And there's this big, epic cosmic battle that most of us kind of think of in a Frank Peretti-ish kind of way. And then we got the demons down below fighting up. And then Lex Luthor, the bad guy, turns, and he has this unbelievable, shocking, tiny little statement that blows my mind. You want, this is like written for the headlines today. Check it out. Here's what he says. He says, that should be upside down. But we know better now, don't we? Devils don't come from hell beneath us. Oh, no, no. They come from the sky. He's so twisted. Y'all, good people believe this way. Good, well-meaning people have bought into a lie. And things have been turned upside down. This battle of good and evil, the world is turned upside down. And the lines are being totally, deliberately being blurred by the unseen enemy. We have to stand firm. We have to finish strong. A frightened world needs a fearless church. Count on it. They're looking to you to be the lighthouse in the dark. Does that terrify anybody else? <laughs> you know, you look around for the cavalry. You're it. <laughs> you know, some days I kind of walk into a room and I always just kind of, I'm looking for some, like some older person that like is going to ride in and take over and just, you know, and I go, oh, wait, that's right. It's on our watch. It's us. We've got to be firm. 
with what we believe. We've got to finish our race. So I'm going to put a picture up. We're going to end, uh, we're going to end it this way. I think, band, you guys can go ahead and get into place. I want to put this photo up, and I want you to see if anyone recognizes these two people, and if so, what are they famous for? Does anybody know? If you don't, don't feel bad, because I didn't until recently. All right? This is Roald Amundsen, and this is Sir Robert Falcon Scott. These two men were rivals. The guy on the left was a little bit older. They were two adventurers, and they were setting out in a race to be the first people in modern history to reach the South Pole. This year was uh, 1911, and it was summer, and it was still 20 degrees below zero when they left. Now, I want you to think about this. One team was led by Roald Amundsen, the older gentleman, and one team was led by the young buck known as Sir Walter uh, Falcon Scott. Two incredible men, both with comparable experience, both started their journey at 1,400 miles from the center, and they both had the same weather conditions. But the two teams had dramatically different strategies. Robert Falcon, Scott, led his team based on the current conditions. In other words, if the weather was good, he would keep marching 30, 40, 50 miles in the day. But if the weather turned bad and the gale force winds coming against him, he would travel far less or not at all. And they would just hunker down for the day. He let the environment dictate his distance. Some days he led his team to utter exhaustion. Other days he circled the wagons to utter boredom. Amundsen, on the other hand, had a totally different strategy. He decided he would march 15 to 20 miles every single day, regardless of the weather. It didn't matter what the conditions were. On good days, he would go the same distance, even though some of his team would say, hey, we got this. Let's go farther. We can do this. It's good weather. We can go farther. He said, nope, we're going to stop. We've accomplished our goal for the day, and we're going to rest. Then on other days, he would lead his team the exact same amount, even though many complained that the weather was bad. He didn't let his environment dictate his distance. He didn't listen to the sway of his team to get him on a side street, to take him on a distracted sideline. They would march 15 to 20 miles every day and then rest, even when they didn't feel like it. Who won? I know, I know you're curious, right? Amundsen won, the old guy. And guess what? It was so good. It wasn't even close. The young buck Remember, same distance, same weather conditions. He arrived at the South Pole 34 days later. 34 days later? Are you kidding me? And guess what? It's sad. He didn't learn his lesson because he turned around and he employed the exact same strategy going back and he, along with every single person on his team, perished. He didn't learn his lesson. He was so distracted by the elements around him Church, hear me, there will be days where the unseen enemy will try to discourage you, distract you, sideline you, get you to flat out quit a divine calling he has given you, a mission, your mission field, whatever that is, don't do it. Finish strong. Let me encourage you. Finish strong. Maybe you've fallen down on the track. Maybe you you gave out of gas in that marathon. Maybe you were the guy who ran all the way down the field and you dropped the ball on the one-yard line. Okay, okay, it happens. So what? Pick up the ball and get in the end zone. Get back up on your horse and ride. We need you. We need the world needs you. The world needs to see a fearless church during these dark days. Get back up. Finish strong. Stay off the side streets. Stay focused. Stay off the sidelines. Stay faithful. The Lord Himself is standing at the finish line. His arms are open and He's ready to greet you. Let me encourage you run toward Him. Stay faithful. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray, and we're going to open up the altar. Maybe you just want to pour out your heart to the Lord. Maybe you feel him speaking to you. There's something, some distraction, some sand a lot has come in your life. Maybe you need to pray for them. Maybe you need to offer forgiveness to somebody. Whatever it is, just be obedient. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray, and then we'll open up the altar. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you are here. Thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that this could be two, three, four thousand years ago, And it is just as real for us today. Thank you that your word is timeless. God, we pray that we would be the lighthouse you've called us to be. Forgive us for the times we've been distracted to look left or right. Help us to keep the main thing the main thing, to love you, to love others, to worship you, and to tell others about you. God, we intercede for our communities. 
We intercede for our missionaries overseas as they share the good news. We intercede for those who are hurting. God, we pray that you would call us all back to repentance and be on your, your path, your road that leads us where we're supposed to be, the divinely appointed mission. Speak to us now in these moments. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.